Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 23, if you will. Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> Jesus has just spent the most grueling night of his life. He's been beaten, he's been spat upon, he has been ridiculed, he's gone through six different trials, three Roman, three religious trials, all of which were illegal. Um, it was uh, a law that any kind of court and accusations could not be judged or tried uh, in the darkness. And so he's gone through six of these trials now, none of which uh, stood the test of uh, their own standards. He's now headed outside the gates of Jerusalem to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. I've been there five or six different times. The reason that it is called that is if you look up at that rocky cliff side there, it takes the form of a skull. So he's being marched there. And I want you to see kind of the scenery now that is with him, beginning, if you will, in verse number 30, excuse me, verse number 27. And there followed him a great company of people and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. Verse 32. And there were also two others, male factors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they, there they crucified him and the male factors, one uh, on the right hand and the other on the left. Then he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They parted his raiment and cast lots. The people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And they said to him, um, If you're really who you say you are, if you really uh, what the inscription above you says, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Well, he didn't have any intention of saving himself. It wasn't what he came to do. That Hebrew passage thoroughly staggers my imagination that says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. So the last thing Jesus wanted to do uh, was to call 10,000 angels to come and take him down from that cross because he was fulfilling even what Genesis 3.15 had described. Centuries of prophecy. The embodiment of them hanging on there at accomplishing what God had intended from the beginning. Not to save himself, but to save others. It's in the midst of that that our Lord looks down at the people that are around him. And I believe not only that, I think he looked down through the centuries of time. And he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. I think we've got to understand what Jesus was talking about here um, so imperatively. I, I, I think it's absolutely essential that you understand why Jesus came and what he is speaking of here from the cross. Forgiveness. Forgive their sin. Wipe away their guilt. Um, how many of you went on a trip sometime over the holidays of Christmas? Maybe you went to Orlando or maybe you took a trip up to Boone to go skiing. Maybe you uh, 
uh, took a trip out west. How many of you have ever been on a guilt trip? Mm -hmm. They're uh, not fun, are they? Jesus said, forgive them. It is possible for us to live a guilt-free life. Jesus made that possible there on the cross. Guilt-free, yeah, that's, that's a, isn't that a wonderful concept? Some of you that are watching by live stream or by television, some of you that may be sitting here today yearn for a life that is guilt-free. Well, you can have it. Jesus made it possible, and I'm going to tell you this morning how that you can have that kind of life, uh, how you can live guilt-free in your life. Now, here, here's, here's three things that I, I want to kind of share with you this morning before we leave. Uh, I want to talk to you a little while about what we normally do with uh, our guilt and our sin, and then I want to talk to you about what we need to do with our guilt and our sin. And then I want to spend the last few minutes of the message this morning sharing with you what Jesus actually does with our sin. Okay? So let's dig in for a minute. What do we normally do with our sin? What do we normally do uh, with our guilt? Well, one of the things that most people do with their sin and their guilt is that they want to conceal them. They want to hide their sin. They want to cover it up. They want to bury their sin. You remember the story of Adam and Eve uh, when Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit. What did they immediately try to do? They tried to cover up their sin. They tried to hide their sin. They tried to bury their sin. And that's what normally uh, most people do is to conceal their sin. But the fact of the matter is uh, our sin and our guilt is like Groundhog Day. It just keeps resurrecting. It keeps coming back. It keeps resurfacing to us and keeps coming back around with us when we try to conceal it. Here's what the Word says in Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He's not talking about us covering. He's talking about being blessed because God through Christ has covered our sin. But watch this. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there's no guile. When I kept silence, when I buried my sin, when I concealed my sin, my bones waxed old. <laughs> you ever feel like your bones just get old? Through the roaring all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I felt so bad that my mouth dried up. The moisture in my mouth dissipated. And it was like the drought of summer, the psalmist said. And then there's a little transition. He says, I acknowledge my sin before you and my iniquity have I not concealed it anymore. I haven't hidden my sin. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin wow plop plop fizz fizz oh what a relief it is to be forgiven now how do you conceal it let me share with you a few ways that people conceal or hide their sin one of the ways is that they dismiss their sin they say, you know, that happened so long ago. It's not even important in my life anymore. I, I've, I've almost forgotten about that. But no, you haven't. Because it keeps resurfacing. It keeps popping back up. It is important or you wouldn't be thinking about it as much as you think about it. It still comes back to your mind on a regular basis. Dismissing your sin does not work. Some people downsize their sin. And, and they say, well, everybody else is doing it. Well, whoop de do. What difference does that make if everybody else is committing the same sin? How irrelevant is that? It has nothing to do with me. If I have transgressed, if I have sinned, it's still on me. And what they do has nothing to do with it. 
I still have to take responsibility. So dismissing my sin doesn't work. Downsizing my sin doesn't work. But here's what a lot of people do. Not only do they dismiss it and downsize it, they develop it. They think, well, you know what? <laughs> Maybe it won't be so bad the next time. Uh, you know, the first time, yeah, I, that was kind of tough, but you go into it again and you discover the second time was a little bit easier than the first time. And so you just keep on and keep on and keeping on until I can just do it now and it doesn't bother me at all. Well, you know, murdering your 15th victim may not hurt you as bad as murdering your first victim, but it's still murder at 15 as it was at 1. Lying, you can tell that lie over and over and over again, and it may not hurt the 25th time, but it's still a lie. Lust is still lust even after years of committing it. So developing the sin doesn't work either. It's still sin. The Bible says, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes their sin will have mercy. Here's what God's word says. Be sure your sin, you can bury it, you can conceal it, you can do all of that stuff you want to do, but be sure it's going to find you out. Whatever you sow, it's going to come out. It's going, you're going to reap it. So concealing does not work. By the way, let me just say a word here because th th this is just a little pet for me. I, I can't help it. I got, do you know that the internet is probably the biggest bank of guilt and sin that you'll ever find? You do realize, hey, students, young adults, listen, you do realize those stupid videos and photos that you are posting are global and permanent and one of these days you're going to look back and you're going to see all of that stuff that you put out there thinking, ah, this is just fun. It's going to come back on you. It doesn't go away. It's going to be there. It's going to catch up with you sometime down the road. L let, me, let me give you the next week. We not only can conceal our sin. Here's what a lot of people do. Here's what a lot of people do. We condemn others for our sin. Adam, where are you? I, I'm here in the cool of the day. I, I'm meeting up with you like we always do, but you're not here. Where are you? Well, well the Lord, uh, you know, I was naked and I hid. I've tried to conceal. I've tried to hide my sin. Well, what happened to you, Adam? Well, why'd you do what you did? That woman, God, she's, she's my problem. I wouldn't be in this sin if it weren't for her. She, she's, she's the issue. Eve, what, what did you do that for? Well, why did you put your husband in that position? That snake, that lousy snake. And that's just like us. Sin comes and we get in the midst of sin and the conviction begins to hit us. And what's the first thing we do? We start blaming somebody else for our own demise. Well, God, I'd, I'd, be, a, I'd be a godly man if it wasn't for my wife. I'd be the spiritual leader in my home if I, I had somebody that would follow me. But she just won't follow, so there's really no point in me being there. Well, God, if I just had a husband that would take charge, I, I'd be a godly woman. Baloney. S sometimes we'll even blame God for our mistakes and our sins. Go back to Genesis 3. John can teach this lesson a whole lot better than I can. But, but, but go, back to, go back to that third chapter. Adam, why'd you do that? Well, God, it's your fault. It was that woman you gave me. If you hadn't given me her, it, 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 I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here. We blame God. Get in the midst of uh, bankruptcy. Well, God, why'd you let me get in this shape? God said, I didn't have anything to do with it. You're the one that maxed out your credit cards. 
You're the one that bought the house that you shouldn't have bought. You're the one that fooled around in that silly investment scam thinking you were going to get rich quick. And now then, you're having to file bankruptcy and you want to blame me? I didn't have anything to do with it. It's all on you, buddy. But we want to blame God. Somehow thinking and believing uh, that he didn't come through for us like we thought that he ought to come through for us. And then, not only conceal and condemn, here's a deal I watch a lot of people do. We want to carry it around. We want to carry our sin around with us. Sometimes we'll try to hide it and conceal it, and sometimes we'll criticize and condemn and blame somebody else for it. But most of the time, we want to just walk around with it. L listen to Psalm 38. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low all day long. I go about mourning. My back is killing me. Well, my back is filled with searing pain. Same thing. You get my drift here. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Let me, let me just tell you, if you want to make yourself physically and emotionally sick, just like the word is graphically described, you go around trying to deal with your own sin. You go around carrying that guilt in your own flesh and you watch what happens. It will literally make you sick. You understand resentment is built up because of what other people do to us. But guilt is a result of what we do to other people. And we want to carry that garbage around with. God says your body is not wired to do such a thing as that. I didn't make you like that, God says. And I'll just tell you, it will lead to depression and it will sabotage, sabotage your own success. You'll work hard, you'll climb the ladder, you'll get to where you think you want to be, and then all of a sudden, because you've been carrying that guilt of sin and that burden of sin with you, you get up there on the pinnacle of success and you come to the conclusion, I ought not to be here. I'm not worthy to be here. Um, I, I don't know how I've got to this point. And, and, and you just sabotage everything that you've built up carrying that. So here, here's my message. Stop concealing the sin. Stop trying to hide the fact that you have sin and guilt in your life. Stop blaming somebody else for your own actions. And stop carrying this garbage around. Today ought to be the day that you offload every bit of it. Now, let me give you, as he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let me, let me give you the, uh, what we ought to do now, okay? What's the needed response here? What's the scriptural thing to do? Two or three things. First of all, you have to see it for what it really is. Don't conceal it. Don't condemn it. Don't carry it. Just see it for what it is. You, you know, I've watched a lot of people instead of coming to grips and seeing their sin as God sees their sin, they want to try to ignore it by staying busy. And, and, and really, here's, here's, I've seen it done in the church. Rick, you have too. Uh, I've seen people give themselves to ministry, doing good things, doing great things, but with the wrong motivation. Doing ministry, trying to get away from something of sin that they ought to be dealing with in their own life. I've watched people literally pack up everything that they have in some 18-wheel truck and leave North Carolina and go to some foreign country like California. I, I, I've watched them do that. But, but i got news for you. You took you with you when you went. You can't get away from you. And when you put your head on the pillow at night, guess what? 
You go to sleep with you, with all of the sin, with all of the guilt. It followed you there. So you got to just see this stuff for what it really is. You've got to admit, you know what, I've got sin in my life that needs to be dealt with here. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 8, if we say that we don't have any sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I, I advocated this about three or four weeks ago and I still advocate it again today. You ought to find a time to do some spiritual spring cleaning in your own heart and your life. Find a dedicated time and a dedicated spot with a piece of paper and a pencil and just sit down in the presence of the Holy Ghost and say, you know what, God, I want to come clean with you today and I want you to tell me, and by the way, you already know more than what you're confessing. And just write down what that sin is and be open to the Holy Spirit as he says to you, do you know that's lust? Do you, do you know that you stole this right here? Do you know that you had a wrong spirit about this? And he'll tell you, write it down, see it for what it is, admit it before God. If you want a little bit of a help sheet to go with that, our website, go to fbcit.org, go to family resources, bottom right hand corner, and it will give you a spiritual survey that you can take and just get along with God and just do business with God and come clean. See it for what it is. Admit it for what it is before God. Then settle it. Just settle it. See it and then settle it. What do you mean by that? I, I mean accept responsibility for your own actions. Own it. You know what? That's right. I did say that. Yes, I did do that. I, I got nobody else to blame for this. This is on me. One of the greatest prayers that I think that uh, you'll ever read in the Word of God is in Psalm 51. It's when David confessed his sin with Bathsheba. Do you remember the story how David sinned against God and against his family? He had Bathsheba's husband killed. He birthed a child through her without... Uh, any kind of uh, pleasing unto God whatsoever. A whole year goes by. Nathan comes in and he says, you know what you did? And David said, yep, you know what, you're right. And Psalm 51 is David's confession before God. You know, I, I, I've been pastoring for whew, a long time. I've read Psalm 51, whew, I don't know, a long time. There's something missing in there that I didn't realize until recently. David never mentioned Bathsheba. He owned it. It was his deal. It was his sin. And he said, I acknowledge my sin before you. It was me who sinned against you. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to upset you a little bit. I, I did before and I'm going to do it again, but it's worth it. Uh, you, you're having a struggle doing it. And the reason I know that, not one person has come back to me and told me that they did what we encouraged them to do. So I'm going to tell you again. Do you know the best way to own your sin is to find you a spiritual accountability partner. Somebody that walks with God, somebody that is confidential, somebody that you trust and they trust you and you tell them your sin. Now, here's the deal. It's not for forgiveness. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sin. But James says, for your sin healing. I love it when somebody comes up to me and they say to me, Pastor, I want to tell you something I've never told anybody else in my life. I get real excited, man. I'm, wow. You thinking, yeah, you just want that old juicy gossip. No, no, no. Not so. I get excited when somebody tells me that because I know the moment that they do that, it's like a big old balloon that goes pop and they are set free and delivered and healed from the bondage of sin when they do it. 
find somebody. And can I say this? I'm not preaching something here I don't practice on a regular basis. I have that person in my life. Knows everything about me. And I am. And it's liberating. Find that person. Confess the sin, not for the healing of it, but for the deliverance from it. And then next you want to seek God's forgiveness. Okay? You, you want to see it for what it is. You want to settle it. You want to own it. And then you want to seek the forgiveness of God. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sin, oh, I love this. I love this. It's probably the most practiced verse of scripture I have. If we confess our sins, God is faithful. God is just to forgive us. Father, forgive them. Of all of our sin. Every bit of it. Here's the deal with God. You ready for this? I, I, I've shared this with you. I, I, I think you need to hear it again. You, you don't have to beg God. Please, 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 please. No. You genuinely, sincerely go before God and ask him to forgive you. God's word says, I will. You don't have to bargain with God. God, I, I promise you, if you'll forgive me of this sin, I'll never do it again. You don't have to bargain with God. You don't have to bribe God. God, God if, you, if you just see me through this, God, if you just forget, I, I'll go preach. I, I'll go in ministry. I, I'll be a missionary. No, you don't have to bargain with God. You don't have to bribe God. All you have to do is believe God. And he says, I am faithful. That's all you got to believe. I'm faithful. I'll do what I say that I'm going to do. I'm just. I'll do the right thing about this. So you don't have to beg. You don't have to bargain. You don't have to bribe. All you got to do is just simply believe what God says. If you're here today and you're lost without Jesus Christ, you're you don't have the assurance that you're going to go to heaven when you die. You've never been delivered from the bondage of sin. Here's God's promise to you. And this is all you have to believe. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all you've got to believe. Trust him. Now, what happens when you do that, okay? We normally conceal our sin. But what we ought to really do is admit our sin. When we admit our sin, what happens? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, there is prompt forgiveness. Isaiah chapter 55 says, when the righteous confess or when the unrighteous confess, he is quick to forgive. You say, well, I think you ought to feel guilty when you sin. Well, I do too. For about 10 seconds. You sin and the Holy Ghost of God convicts you of that sin. And for about 10 seconds, and that's all that it takes to come to grips with your sin and admit that you're sin and cry out to God for forgiveness. And if you feel guilty for it after that, that's not of God. His forgiveness is prompt. His forgiveness is total. Let me ask you a question. You ready? You listening? Say amen. How many of your sins did Jesus die for? Exactly. All of them. Last year's, right now, next year's, he paid the price for every bit of that. All of your sins. Now, if Jesus paid your sin debt for your past, present, and future sin. If you die and go to hell, it's on you, friend, not on Jesus. Colossians 2, boy, it's powerful. L listen to this. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having... Ooh, 
having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. It's better than any nail polish remover you've ever bought from CVS. I'm telling you, the Bible says he wiped it away. He cleansed it. As if it had never happened. Because he nailed our sin to the cross. Now if you don't believe that, then the next thing that happens bad in your life, you're immediately going to think, uh oh, God's paying me back for what I did. Hey, 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 let me tell you something. God doesn't forgive you of your sin on one day and then the next day turns around and punishes you for the sin that he forgave. That's not of God. It's total forgiveness. He paid for that sin. On Calvary's cross. It's done. It's finished. And then. I love this part. Uh, his forgiveness is continual. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Here's what we do. We, we go before God and say oh God here I am again. I did it again, God. I told you I wasn't going to do it again, but I did it again. Oh, God, could you, would you forgive me? And we've got this anticipation that the Holy Spirit says, uh, Hey, Mike, this is the 1,000th time that you have come to me asking me to forgive you for that same sin. I just want you to know that your forgiveness was exasperated on 999. We don't have forgiveness for the thousandth time. No, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Praying for us. Let me ask you this morning, um, <clears throat> what sin is hounding you? What, what habitual sin right now is uh, on your heels chasing after you? As I preach, Ephesians 1 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. You don't have to live a life under the burden of sin and guilt. God made it possible through his son. This is the very essence and the basics of Christianity. God saw your problem and he took your problem and he made it his problem. And he put that problem on his son who went to the cross of Calvary and paid your sin debt in full forever and ever. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. It is the free gift of God through his grace. It's not cheap. It costs God his son. It costs Jesus his life. But he did it for you. The cross is the foundation. When we see Jesus as they nailed him to that cross, as he cried out for our forgiveness. Understand that the cross is the foundation that God did everything there for you and for me. So if you were to die today, right now, in your seat, boom, heart quit, mind shot, where would you spend eternity? Has your sin been forgiven? Have you genuinely come to Christ? Admitted that you were a sinner? Acknowledged it, owned it? And ask him to forgive you? And at that moment, listen, salvation is such a cataclysmic, convulsive event that leaves you changed forever and ever. Old things pass away. Everything becomes new. He makes you a brand new creation. 
Where were you when that happened in your life? If you've not been made new, if you can't go back to that moment in time, that place where Jesus Christ became real to you and life forever changed at that moment, in all probability you've never been saved. And you need Jesus, you need that forgiveness. And it is time today that you quit hiding your sin and burying it. It's time today that you quit blaming somebody else for your sin. It's time today that you got out from under the burden of that guilt and quit carrying it around. It is time today that you admit that you are a sinner. Acknowledge it before God. Settle it with Him and to seek His forgiveness. Don't you leave this auditorium today without Jesus. Don't you cut that computer off or that television set off today without settling this matter of sin with Jesus. He can and will change you. He will forgive you. He will set you free. You don't have to live under the burden of guilt. Would you stand with me, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to pray for you first. And then after I pray for you, I want to try to lead you in a time of prayer this morning before you leave. Father, I lift up this people to you, those that are physically here and those that are here through a website or television. Lord, I, I believe with all of my heart, because I've been praying all week about this, I believe with all of my heart that there are a number of people here today that you want to set free by your grace and your mercy. I pray, God, that you would remove the blinders from their eyes so that they could see their need for you. May their heart be opened and receptive to your forgiveness. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.